Hey everybody, it's Molly Wood. Thanks for watching Make Me Smart on the YouTubes. Do us a favor, hit the subscribe button, and then you'll be able to stay up to date on our latest episodes, and you will be the first to know when we fire up that live stream, because we got this now. We got it. All right, Drew, <laughs> hit it. Let's get this show on the road. Man. Man, oh man. I saw a tweet Deep. yesterday, Molly Wood, that Deep. said, you know, the one thing this guy has learned from listening to this podcast, well, he's learned a lot, but the other thing he learned was, you and I are never ready for the music to start. And I just thought that was very That's really true. That's I really true. That and today we had three extra true. minutes and we're still just goofing I off. I know. I know. Yeah. We're like just kind of messing around. Hey, everybody. I'm Kyle <laughs> Rizdal. It is Tuesday. The big show. Make me smart. Me and Molly Wood. Tech, the economy, and culture. Trying to best to, to keep up with what is going on. And oh, my goodness, is there a lot going on. Uh, today, we're going to talk about um, people going back to work, but more importantly, trying to do it while managing um, there are kids who are not necessarily in school, who are not necessarily able to, able to go to child care. Um, and we're going to talk about the whole dynamic because it is, it is incredibly complicated and oh so real for so many parents. We are. And we're going to talk about it in the context of, uh, because just, you know, word to the producers, I'm going to bring in a bunch of education here too, because we're also having a conversation right this second. Uh, everybody I know who has kids about schools whether they're going to reopen, how they're going to reopen, what that's going to mean, whether people can continue to work. Because fundamentally, if you have parents in this country and they're at home with children, they're not getting as much work done as they were before. And they mm -hmm. cannot get as much work done as they were before. And we're looking in many cases at parents who will be in that position through the end of the year. And mm -hmm. we as a country have to get real serious about the fact that there can be no reopening if the kids can't go somewhere safe. So that's the plan yeah. for today. So we're going to do that. We're going to have that conversation with Valerie Strauss. She's a reporter at the Washington Post. She's been covering education for a long, long time. Also talking and, and working in her recent reporting uh, about child care. So we hit the double header today. We're going to get both of those with her. Valerie, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Are you, hey, as am I, and I believe Ms. Wood is as well, uh, as gobsmacked uh, uh, as the rest of us that um, everybody's talking about going back to work and reopening businesses, but there is scant conversation about child care in schools? I'm always gobsmacked about the way we talk about schools and <laughs> child care. But mm. uh, yes, particularly child care, we hear a lot about schools, although there are, nobody has any answers, nobody knows exactly what to do. Uh, we hear very little about child care. And in fact, the child care system, what we call a system, is more fragile than the public education system and is actually, experts say, in danger of collapse right now, which would be an enormous um, uh, hit on the economy. Yeah, you wrote about this in the Post. And I wonder, um, first of all, what do we even mean when we say America's child care system? Yeah. Like, what question. is that system? Is it a federally funded system? Because I've mm. certainly never, you know, I mean, I know right. we have some things like Head Start, but yeah, like give us the overarching view of what that even means in this country. Right. It, it doesn't, it's not really a system as we know systems. It is a, um, a patchwork of like 675,000 different programs. Some, uh, most of them are not licensed. Some of them are multi um, are programs in, in, with multiple kids. Some of them are single providers in homes. Uh, it's a huge business. It's about fifty-seven billion to sixty billion just just mm. for direct costs. And then when you spill over on goods and services, it can be up to hundred billion a year. And and there is almost no talk about how to take care of children, particularly young children in this country. Before the pandemic and even now, there has been some legislation, but it's unclear when it will pass. And even the $50 billion, for example, that the Senate, uh, that the Democrats put forth in the Senate would only stabilize right now what's happening. It wouldn't even begin to fix the problems. Hmm. Okay, so. Um... <laughs> Uh, That's a lot. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, no, it is. Look, and, and uh, here, this is, so this is a really subjective question, and, and um, it, it bounces off your answer to the first one, which is you're always gobsmacked by the way we talk about it or don't talk about it. Um, is there a way 
that we can reopen this economy fully without solving the school and child care crisis? No. I mean, that's, a, that's not even subjective. That's objective. People yeah, yeah. who have, you know, millions of people have kids and they have to have a place, a safe place for their kids. Now they're used to having them in schools and they're used to having them in childcare programs. Although it's very difficult for many parents to find affordable childcare, even in the best of times. Um, so there is absolutely no way to fully reopen the economy um, without, without fixing this problem. And, and there are no answers. There are no fixes right now that can do it. What were, you know, it's, it's been interesting as this conversation has evolved because it's clear that a lot of white working parents are now just starting to discover um, mm -hmm. what poorer people in this economy or single moms in this economy or people of color in this economy who are also economically disadvantaged have experienced forever, which is childcare is expensive, out of reach, not always safe. Like, what are the problems, you know, if we go all the way back to the existing brokenness of the child care system, what are the problems we have to start with? Okay, getting back to your question about, about it being a system uh, or not a system, like I said, it's this individual uh, patchwork. And the only f real federal response there has been is this subsidy program. The federal government provides subsidies that are targeted to help a certain number of eligible families to afford childcare. Unfortunately, there are, um, can you hear, uh, unfortunately. Of course we can, but don't, don't, don't worry, don't worry about it. Yeah. Like the phone yeah. rings, oh, right? I mean, that's just, it's we just all we're, know. we're making, we all oh, okay. 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 Yeah, okay. 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 I thought I unplugged just it. Okay. Keep going. Okay. About. So unfortunately, there are uh, there's a number of problems here. One is um, quality. A lot of these a lot of these programs aren't quality, and that's something that has uh, experts have been trying to address for for a very long time. Um, as I said, most most of the programs aren't even licensed. Another problem is that the people who work in childcare are among the least paid of the uh, uh, workers in America. They make maybe ten dollars an hour for doing what you know people consider the most important thing, which is taking care of kids. Um, but somehow we don't think that that's worth paying a lot for. And you also have the um, the problem of cost. It is really expensive. It's even expensive for middle class families. So what lower you know low income families do is. Um, it's really, really hard. There, there was a, a survey done in California, which is not a particularly hospitable place for childcare, believe it or not. Um, hmm. A single parent with a median income would spend 60% of their salary on childcare. 60%, mm -hmm. that's how much it can be. Average, you know, maybe um, 1,200 a month, 1,300 a month. Most, most families don't have that. So what families do is cobble things together and families with resources, mm -hmm. you know, can do, can do it better and easier, but it's still not easy unless you're very, very wealthy. It's still not easy for, for middle-class families. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I remember, by the way, I remember paying 60% of my income for childcare and getting to public school kindergarten and being like, I've this is amazing. How much money would you like at the auction? Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, that's, you know, that's part of what's happening now is that some people are, are, are looking at the opening of school as a child care uh, effort. And yeah. so they're pushing to reopen schools in some, in some places, I suspect, for that reason. I mean, what would, what would have compelled the governor of Florida this week to insist yeah. that all the school districts have five day a week learning in school for parents who want it, even while Florida is the hottest, uh, has the biggest outbreak right now. And, you know, there's, looks like there's no stopping it for a while. Mm -hmm. That's, well, the, that, the that sounds like childcare. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That sounds right. like, front... that sounds like a childcare issue and an economy issue. 
Right. 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 The front page of the Miami Herald today was governor orders schools open. And then right down below the fold was governor orders bars and restaurants closed. And you're like, right. Yes. Um, There you go. Right in a nutshell. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Uh, I was doing an interview the other day and I asked the person um, and we were talking about Black Lives Matter and and uh, the protests and all of that. And I said, do you think this time feels different in that it might actually change some things? And she said, without even hesitating, oh, yeah, and I'll tell you why. It's because white people are out on the streets, too. And so the corollary question, I think, with child care in schools is, do you think this time might change the conversation about child care and, and education? Um, and if you do, is it because white people are now going, holy cow, this is a really big problem for me? I Yes and yes. I think yeah. that's exactly what happens. That's how change happens. You know, people get affected and so, oh, my gosh, it can happen to me. And um, and that is what's happening with the Black Lives Matter protests, which is kind of a wonderful thing to see um, that so mm-hmm. many People have been been um, participating and in the in the fight for uh, racial justice, but yes, in terms of childcare, I think there has to be some changes. At least there will be changes in the amount of money the federal government gives to these programs. That would that would be a start. It's certainly it's not all. It's but it's a start. That doesn't fix the problem permanently. It doesn't create an actual system in which states would create licensed child care programs in which uh, families could go, but it will help what there is now. Is there, can you give us a sense of, of what the conversation is about uh, financial assistance from the federal government? Because it feels like it's not a big part of the conversation. And this it's is not. where I point out that women disproportionately are are facing major setbacks as a result of this. I think I saw somewhere, I was trying to look it up actually while you were talking, that something like 47% of working mothers said they would have to drop out of the workforce if school school doesn't resume or childcare isn't somehow subsidized. And yet, I am not seeing that as part of our stimulus conversation. Right. Which what? That's nutty, because if you're you're a policymaker, how do you look at at that as a policymaker and say, oh, no, this is fine. We're going to lose half the women in this workforce. And it's even okay. just say this is fine for the economy. You cannot have a recovery. Right, right, even right. Even if you don't care right. about women right. and equality, right, you can't have a recovery. Now the rage is Absolutely. Back. Absolutely. I mean, even before the pandemic, you know, women were hit, hit harder with, with uh, child care issues. Women, uh, mothers were 40% more likely than fathers to report that, that they had to make adjustments to their careers so they could take care of kids. Um, I'm not saying, you know, that they shouldn't take care of their kids, but women get impacted much more and, and, and now really are, particularly in, during the pandemic, there were studies done and s- more than 60% of parents found that their childcare uh, programs had closed. Now, some of them have opened, but many of them have to operate on social distancing rules, which means they can't bring back as many students. Many of them can't open because they operate normally on very thin margins like restaurants do. And they're, and they're out, they're gone. And we don't know how many, what percentage now of the millions of slots that families depend on will be open this fall, that will be open in the winter. Um, it's like we're seeing 40% of restaurants may never, you know, are probably never gonna reopen. Well, right. that's one thing, but when you're talking about childcare slots, that's another thing. Right. Okay, so look, l- let's talk, uh next steps and and how this might, and let's admit we're talking very long term, let's think about how this might get fixed. Number one, you've already said is more federal dollars. What else has to happen? There has to be a concentration on quality, okay? Um, Mm -hmm. There has to be better licensing efforts. They have to be be enforced. The federal government could decide instead of funding sort of the, the fund, federal funding goes through to families. So the idea would be to actually create a system in which the states have, with the help of federal funding, create high quality childcare programs for everybody who needs mm-hmm. 
That's so, so then, uh, right. and then, and then you make them very, very affordable or you make them free. And so you get cost, you get quality and you get, um, you get capacity. That's, those are the three things you really need to do. If you were a betting woman, Valerie, <laughs> <laughs> how do you know I'm not? <laughs> uh, and perhaps you are. <laughs> yes. Step A, are you a betting woman? And B, <laughs> uh what do you think are the odds of that happening where or rather let me yeah. let me make it less subjective i know you're a reporter where are we with that conversation right now i know the senate democrats have have introduced a child right. care and education relief bill is it going anywhere i think it will go somewhere at some point the problem is that there will be some more money even from republicans on this issue the question is part of the question is when um, for example, it's not just child care programs that say they need the money right now and it's not coming right now, but school systems are. There's a number of school systems that say they cannot open safely without much more federal money now. And the House has passed that money, um, the Senate not so much, and they seem to be in no rush to do it. So you have, for example, a, a San Diego, San Diego Unified School District has announced it's going to reopen schools for all students for the first half of the year because they're expecting the Congress to come up with the money for them to do it for the second half of the year. But if they don't, then everybody's going to have to go home. Wow. Yeah, okay, so we remain on the high wire. Valerie Strauss is a Washington Post reporter covering education and child care. Valerie, thanks so much. We really appreciate the context. Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you. Bye. Take good care. Huge challenge, but so <clears throat> yeah. important. It's like instrumental. It's like it really is like everything, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. OK. <sighs> Interesting. OK. Yeah. Yeah. We report, you decide. <laughs> I don't know. We're headed for a break. Before yeah. we go, <laughs> and I mean, I, we should point out, like, we're, when we have this conversation too, we're not only talking to parents. We're talking to all of yeah. the people without kids who have to pick up the disproportionately high right. amount of load because, like, I right. can't work that much, <laughs> yeah. and people with young kids yeah. at home can't, you know, or like me with my thirteen-year-old okay. can, in theory, do more work by ignoring him than someone with a two-year-old can. But then that he doesn't yeah. win, and I mean nobody nobody can uh, kind of operate st at status can, quo. although i will say my right my, my kids are getting a lot more screen time now than they used to let me just tell you that yeah absolutely you know? i mean we haven't even we didn't even touch on this with with valerie but it's the social emotional development the i mean literally oh, pediatricians yeah. are starting to talk about how school should probably yeah. reopen dangers be damned because it is so bad, you know, the educational outcomes are bad, the, the emotional development is bad, the depression, yep. the just, you know, socialization for children. Like this is such, this is such a huge issue to set back a generation of kids this much with no plan. I mean, that is the future of our country. That is pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Send us your thoughts. Send us your thoughts. Send us your thoughts, he said, uh, clearly this time. Uh, voice memo, email, take your pick. Make me smart, marketplace.org. Uh, we're coming back. I'm out. Oh, oh we're biscuits. back. Biscuits, we're back. Oh, we're back. I'm out. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're back with a little bit of news. Um, I've got mine. You got yours. What do you want to talk about? I believe they're somewhat related, but you begin, please. I believe they are. I believe they are. Uh -huh. So I uh, will begin with an interview that uh, a guy by the name of Rafael Bostic gave to the Financial Times. Um, he is the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. He's been on Marketplace a couple of times. Uh, black economist. Um, did time in the Obama administration. Has been with the Fed in various stints. Anyway, um, he gave an interview to the Financial Times. And I will say, I will preface this by saying I, I always really enjoy my conversations with him. But he said in this interview that the U.S. recovery might be, and this is the quote, leveling off. And all I can think of was, how do you think it's only leveling off? The virus is spiking <laughs> all over this country, right? right? Consumers are not going to go to places where they are going to get sick and conceivably infect others. I think leveling off is charitable. 
I think right. it's really, I, it's, it's so obvious to me that we're going we're gonna to have a, a second leg down in this, what is going to be like a WWWW shaped recovery, right? Because that's the way it's going to go. It's going to bounce up and down yeah. and up and down. Um, I, I just I love him, though I do. I think he's being a little bit not um, as plain spoken as he needs to. <laughs> I like you that know. you were like the long preface of all due respect, sir. <laughs> you wish. Yeah. You wish. Yeah. We were leveling up. Yep. So yeah. That's, that's my news nope. item. I, I just think, I just, you know, the, the moral of the story here is buckle up because I, I just, uh, it's going to be really bouncy for a long time. Yeah. And it's going to be, long, it's a long road. I mean, look, I, I, even in places, and, you know, just to take the focus off of America and our response for just a second, even in places that have legitimately leveled off in terms of infections, like Australia, they're having to reclose. Like they're having to put yeah. more shelter in place orders in place because infections keep spiking. Like there is not, you know, there's not a situation where the virus itself is gone globally. And right. we in the United States may have even lost control in some places of our, our like literally our ability to contain it. Long yeah. road, long road. Even if I wanted to spend yeah. money, there's nowhere for me to go. <laughs> Right. I like, right. you know, I drove up to Point Reyes this weekend and with my son to get a bunch of cheese, oh, which nice. was very exciting. And there was like a clothing store that was open and all the clothes were so ugly and I just still wanted to go in and buy them all. <laughs> all of them. And yeah. I did and I kept my money on the sidelines. Um, did you really? Interesting. And clothing, of course, has been hit the worst of pretty much any sector of retail down like 90% in April or something. So, yeah, yeah. totally. And it's just, and look, I mean, restaurants, I, I don't want to sound brutal, yep. but they're done. Like, restaurants are but done. You don't, good the thing you don't want to sound are, brutal. Oh, my goodness. Uh, uh. Uh, yeah, sorry. I apologize for sounding brutal, but, like, <laughs> get real, you know? Yeah. Get real. How are they How are yeah. they supposed to stay open at a third capacity? Right. I don't know. Right. Yeah, long road. Um, with the growing awareness of the long road in mind, and we did predict this, we have been saying on this show, like that at some point, mm -hmm. you know, Congress was gonna catch the snap and realize that they, that more stimulus was required, and they probably did. Um, it Now there is a little bit more conversation. In fact, as of uh, yesterday, Monday the 6th, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said that a second stimulus check, an actual financial assistance, direct assistance to people, could well be part of the next coronavirus relief bill, um, but that it should be, they believe, much more targeted and that mm -hmm. it would be directed at people who make about $40,000 a year or less. Oh, and that's that interesting. Is... I hadn't seen that little bit. I hadn't seen that little bit. because, And the reason that resonates with me, sorry, is that Jay Powell, yeah. in a press conference a month ago, said 40% uh, of, I'm pretty sure the stat is right, 40% of people, households making $40,000 or less had experienced job loss that yep, month. Exactly. And this was like April yep. or May, right? So, yeah. I think yeah, that that stat is, right? is even- That's where the pain is, yeah. Yep, that's exactly where the pain is. In fact, that exact stat is in this Forbes article where I um, oh, well, saw this yeah. quote from Mitch McConnell, close to 40% of Americans earning less than $40,000 annually. And look, I mean, I don't, I actually don't think this is a case of I think there's some faux outrage about the deficit for sure. Um, oh, but I don't yeah. think that this is a case of, of Congress being particularly stingy. This is in fact the, the people who sincerely need this the most for food and housing for, you know, actual shelter. Um, yeah. There will be questions about, you know, it, it will certainly dramatically reduce eligibility, but let's not forget that our government sent out something like $1.2 billion, over a billion dollars in stimulus checks to people who had died. Well, yeah. I so mean, more. I so right? there is because the, the there rule, is like the rule was if you I can see why yeah, the rule was if you file if you filed the tax return in the eligible year you got the money. Yeah. Right. That's exactly. What they, did. they were just shoveling money out the door. Same thing with the people. They were shoveling money that, out the but, door. Yep. Right. right. And now and anyway. you know now they're going to try to be a little more targeted. I don't think that need, means it needs to be slower. Like great, be targeted faster. Right. And include <laughs> again, and include childcare. Right. <laughs> like, right. But it was that was an interesting note. Um, and suggested that at least that these conversations, we are not in fact starting at zero. They're happening. Right. Which is something, right. I guess. Yeah, that's something. All right, and that's it for the news fix. It is now your turn to talk.
Hi, Kai and Molly. This is Brent in Detroit. This is Rebecca from Baltimore. It was great to hear comments on my question about GDPR. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. We had a conversation last week with Scott Galloway from NYU, uh, which I really enjoyed about higher education, about some of the um, just fallacies that those schools are telling each other and us and their students and some of the some of the changes that actually are going to have to come. Anyway, um, uh, here is what uh, Philip Vieira had to say about that. Hi, Make Me Smart team. Uh, I'm a professor at a university in Southern California, and I enjoyed the recent discussion around higher education. I do agree that a college degree should be available to more people, but in speaking with my colleagues, there is a lot of skepticism around how technology would enable this. It feels like we've been trying to get online education right for many, many years now, and yet students still struggle in that sort of environment. This is particularly difficult for non-traditional students who really do benefit more from face-to-face -face interaction. This opens up the possibility for haves and have-nots. Thanks for all the good discussion. Yeah, and thanks yeah, for the I thoughts. Mean, I, I, I guess the question is, is it a question of how technology is gonna be able to do that or whether, right? Because if mm -hmm. we had really good investment in, in tech, education technology like we do in, oh, I don't know, iPhone technology, right? That'd be something, mm -hmm. that'd be something. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say we don't know what it looks like. You know, we know that yeah. massively open online courses had pretty low success rates because people didn't stay engaged yep. and they dropped out. But we also know that that wasn't there wasn't a lot of accountability and people weren't paying fifty thousand dollars a year to take those classes and get the degrees Ooh. from them. So we like right now we have, you know, lower in lower out be, worse outcomes with online education. Yep. But I think it is true that we really don't know what could be accomplished with that level of yeah. investment. But I, I agree that the, the possibility of haves and have nots, have nots is, I mean, that already exists, but at least you could get a scholarship to go to a school and live on campus and learn. It's very hard, it, like we're, if we're gonna move to an online model in the long term, then we're gonna need scholarships that provide internet access and computers mm -hmm. in the same way that it would have mm -hmm. gotten a kid physically to a school. Um, but I, But you know, I think Scott's overriding message was haves and have nots. It's like the whole higher education conversation in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's sure. that too. 100%. Yeah. Two weeks ago, we played a voice memo uh, from a listener, Joe Wodenshek, who had found a silver lining in his pandemic experience by starting a business he had dreamed about for years, but did not have time to focus on until now. And so we're doing that again today. More silver linings. Here's listener Katie Sullivan. Hi, Kai and Molly. You were talking recently about silver linings for startups during COVID. I'm a Vermont sheep farmer with a new sideline buying New England wool, employing local mills to spin it into yarn, and wholesaling that yarn to local yarn shops. Tiny as it is, my little business touches the huge economic themes of our time, local agriculture, onshore manufacture, and new alternatives to in-person big box shopping. I'm counting on people staying home and knitting this summer instead of vacationing and gathering. Looking at Australian wool prices lately, I'm reasonably confident that supply and transport disruptions will trickle through the globalized world of textiles to give my hyperlocal effort a boost. Thanks for the pod. My sheep and I listen to it together sometimes. I'm sorry. So I freaking love that. I freaking I love, love that. so much. I know I'm dying. That might be my favorite <laughs> listener letter ever. Ever. Can you make her a regular? You know how you have that awesome farmer lady. Oh, now, can you man. also include That's the right. sheep farmer? That's right. What a good idea! What a good idea! I mean, seriously. I'm just gonna write this down. Right, Katie Sullivan. Yes, like monthly. I lo how, I love this. Also, I think we should do an episode on onshore manufacturing. I think that is a super interesting. Like we've talked on, we've talked about what do you think, listeners? We have talked about sort of how to tackle the idea of globalization as a driver of so many of the politics that we've seen, so many of the economic disruptions of the last 50 years or so. Um, and I, I feel like this question yeah. of onshore versus offshore is, is really significant. I even, I think I saw even a story today about, um, yeah, Joe Biden put out a, a, a plan based around bolstering U.S. supply chain capabilities, which is like hmm. a sign of the times, if I ever heard one. Yep, for sure. 
Katie Sullivan, yeah, the sheep. That? So great. Sheep farmer in Vermont. Also, that's awesome. I see you, Katie. I'm totally sitting home knitting in the summer, whether I want to or not. <laughs> Oh, All right. Man. We uh, we do not have a make me smart question today or an answer rather. So please send them marketplace uh, make me smart at marketplace.org. But a little birdie told me that Kai might have an answer. Well, so there's there's something that's been bugging me lately. Actually, there are many things that have been bugging me lately. But uh, but when we when we realized as we were going over the over the rundown this morning that we didn't really have uh, uh, a make me smart answer that we wanted to use. Um, I got to thinking, and I got to thinking about, and I'm sure you remember this, the couple of times that you and I have answered this question, mine is always a variation of, I always thought, but it turned out I was wrong about, if you kept your head down, and you did your job, and you did it right, things would work out, and and you would fundamentally be rewarded, and everything would be good. Mm -hmm. And I think the pandemic corollary to that is, um, if you wear your mask, and you stay away from people when you're out in public, and you do everything right, everything's going to be okay because people understand that, and we're going to kill this disease. And I was wrong about that. I mean, demonstrably, I was wrong about that. Yeah. And that makes me crazy. Right? I mean, wear, wear, wear a freaking mask. Yeah. Wash your hands. That's it. Care about that other was, people. That was my... Care about other people. Be responsible. Care about other people. Take leadership yeah. even if none is being offered. You know? Yep. Yeah. That's what I got. Hi. You have what? Perfectly, almost to the word, articulated everything that I'm feeling this week. Okay. Agree. Good. Endorse okay. what he Good. said. Boom. And that's it for Boom. our show today. Don't forget to sign up for the Make Me Smart newsletter at marketplace.org slash newsletters. Please send us your answers. That question one more time. What is something you thought you knew and you later found out you were wrong about? So many things, friends. So many things. We <laughs> will be back tomorrow with What Do You Want to Know Wednesday. So also email your questions to make me smart at marketplace.org with the subject line questions. Oh, I heard a critter. And we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah that was on my end. <laughs> <laughs> Dog number one. We got bones. We got critters. We got kids. Make Me Smart is produced and directed by Sam Anderson. Our digital producer oh, is Tony Wagner. Tony Wagner. That's me. I also read podcast ads. Thanks to our video producer, Ben Hethcote, our video intern, Ethan Peretz, and writer producer, Erica Phillips. Today's program was engineered by Drew Jostead and mixed by Garrett Lang. Our theme music was composed by Ben Tolliday and Daniel Ramirez. Nice. The executive director of On Demand is Sitar Nieves, and the senior vice president and general manager is Deborah Clark. There we go. So that's Eric Boom. down. We got Tony down. There's like three, four more to go. Uh -huh, we got more. Y'all wanted to hear what they sound like, do we? I love it. We're I like Tony's like full disclosure too. He's like, "Yes, I am the ad guy." <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, it's always fun. In to play case you're match wondering, the voice. Yeah. It's also me. <laughs> oh, I feel so relaxed. That was there so easy. Go. Boom. Done.